asking them, you know, what is it that they want? What have they tried so far? You know, have they had coaching before? If they have, did it work? Did it not work? If it did, how did it work? If it didn't, you're like, you know, why didn't it work? So that the soon as you start to show that vested interest rather than just the, you know, like, give me your money, you're like, and I'll, I'll sort you out type of thing, then that relationship starts to build. And the, the old adage of, you know, trust being, you know, really difficult so like in a long-term process of building but you're like really really simple and quick to lose if you do the wrong thing in the wrong way yeah is is really important to remember because if you're if you're building a relationship and you're letting the client know that look this is what i can do and this is what i can't do and this is what i won't do and these are the the different interventions that you know that i might make uh, one of them being, for example, if something comes up which is more therapeutic and they need to be referred, then that starts to give the client or the potential client that sense of, you know, I can trust this person because they clearly know what they're doing, or at least from that moment, they think they clearly know what they're doing. And barriers then start to, to break down because it's, I think it's rare that any client you're like on on day one or even session one just you like spills everything out and says right you're like this is everything that's going on in my world but they need to have that sense of having the trust to start somewhere and then you know and then build it from there so i I think so like the the two are really intrinsically linked Mm, thank you moni what would you add to that i wonder Definitely building that rapport is first and foremost, and it can even start during the sales cycle or during the marketing phases when a coach may be promoting themselves on social media through their own website and sharing information about themselves, their background, so that when they begin the actual sales cycle where they have a prospect who might be interested then as david said you start by asking a lot of really good questions a lot of open-ended questions trying to learn more about that prospect and understand where they're coming from so it's it's an exchange of information back and forth i do a lot of sharing of my own experiences so that they understand more about me and i do that even in the process of marketing and also listening listening is that key skill uh where you're letting the client talk about their situation so i think that that whole building rapport piece is first and foremost so that by the time you get to the actual first coaching session there is already some trust built and then that continues to build actually during each coaching session Hmm. i guess that's why we have the saying isn't it that people still buy people regardless of all the technology Mm. that's out there it's about you know dealing with like-minded people and finding those relational clients as opposed to the transactional customers Uh, and what about rapport being a skill like any other you can learn what would you say about that? Because I know from a, a HR background, we used to say if somebody had the right attitude, we could train them in the skills. But if they haven't got the attitude, you know, it's it's not something that we could train in. What do you think about rapport being a skill that somebody can learn? Well, I'll speak to that because I work with a lot of executives and they are responsible for coaching their mm-hmm. direct reports. And a lot of them are trying to learn more about building rapport. I think it can be taught things like how to ask open-ended questions instead of closed-ended questions, empathy. That's, that's really big right now. Mm-hmm. A lot of leaders say, I'm, I'm just not wired that way, but I've gotten feedback that my direct reports need to see more empathy in mm-hmm. order to, to open up more in coaching sessions. So there, it's, it's all about those soft skills, the emotional intelligence. And I think those things can be taught, but the person needs to be open to learning. Hmm. David, emotional intelligence is something you know a lot about in terms of the research that you've done and the white papers that you write. What, what's your take on this? 
I think Monique's uh, absolutely right. And there's a lot of evidence out there that the, the interpersonal skills as well as the intrapersonal skills, so like when they're combined, give you sort of you're like much more of an understanding so like of your client but certainly so like enhance the way that you you communicate with them and one of the things about uh, so like a lot of programs you know and a lot of books that you read will say oh yeah build up rapport with your client it comes out of interviewing skills as well you know so you're like build rapport and then you know and then you'll be fine but you know actually understanding what rapport is is also a key skill so from, from an emotional intelligence point of view, that self-awareness, so if we start with the self-awareness piece, that's really you know, like recognizing that, yeah, yeah, my rapport building skills are quite good. And I emphasize the word there, you're sort of quite good, but they could be better. So if they could be better, in what way? You know, is, it the, is it the opening end and questions, as, as Monique was saying? You know, is it the empathy? And there's a lot of research and, and papers around you know, whether you can learn empathy, or whether you can learn true empathy, so like what the difference is between empathy and, and sympathy. And you know, part of that, that sort of, the route that I tend to take with empathy is that you can be empathetic towards anybody in any given situation. So like if that's part of your, you know, sorry, if that's part of your personality, it's not one of the things that you know, is easy to learn. It's more one of the things that's easier to recognize whether you do or whether you don't. And I've spoke to a number of um, psychologists and counsellors who will argue, and there's two sides of the coin for this, that for true empathy, you have to have been through that, that sort of experience yourself because then you've, you've actually lived it, you know, you've sort of, you've walked in those shoes. Otherwise, it's really just, you know, it's observing it from a different angle. But certainly that ability to be empathetic, to understand a, a client's perspective, and to accept that that's their perspective, not to judge it, not to uh, knock it down in any way. You know, the role of perhaps you're like asking permission to say, well, okay, you're like, I understand your views in that. Uh, you know, with your permission, I'd like to explore that a little bit further. You'll know, give you the opportunity of perhaps seeing it from a number of different perspectives. Equally, so then starts to build that, that trust because you're using then um, not just your own self-awareness, but you're then stepping into the, uh, so like the, the relationship awareness or awareness of others. So like box and without going into the so like a number of emotional intelligence models. And then from there, you've got that, that ability to really start you know, like managing the relationship. And while you're doing that, it allows you to start picking up on the little nuances of you know, the way people speak, the way they take pauses, the way they respond to questions. And as you adapt, and they adapt, so like, you know, that's when that, that relationship really starts to you know, like really starts to kick in. And uh, certainly, uh, probably the last thing I would say, so like from an emotional intelligence point of view, is if you imagine this as an equilateral triangle, and we have the the sort of the behaviours or the attitudes um, that we have, which you know, demonstrates you know, this is the way that we do something. And then we have the, the motivations, the underpinning reason why we do something. That triangle is not complete until you've, you know, you've got that recognition of uh, the interpersonal aspect, right? This is the way that I go about doing that. Um, so especially now, as Monique was saying, you know, you know, they need to be able to communicate in a certain way, the, way, the ability to build trust in you know, what we say, why we say it, that, that clients recognize that, you know, if my coach is asking me to complete an exercise, there's a reason for it. It's not just that you know, it was in their folder or you know, it was in a book that they've just read. And they need to have that, that trust. And it also links back, just making a, sort of like a quick causal link, to what we've already talked about in the coaching agreement around confidentiality. Because the more that a client starts to trust you, the more that they start to open up, more is the chance that they will come out with something that is just totally unexpected. Mm. I just want to pick up on the point uh, of coaches saying these two little words that I think are quite problematic, I understand. Um, I think we've got to be very careful about saying I understand, because obviously we're not our client, we're not in their same situation. Even siblings, 
we know experience the same situation in very different ways. So what do you think you could say to build rapport without using those words that would allow a client potentially to throw back at you? Really? How can you possibly understand? You're not me. Uh, what would be a better way of empathizing with your client and, and saying that you empathize without using those, I think, quite dangerous words, I understand. David, you, you pick up on that first, if you would, seeing as you just spoke last and it was you that I was quoting. Okay, yeah, sure. I think the what you have to take into consideration so like, is, is what the client is talking about. Mm -hmm. And you know, you, you're right in the sense of you're like, you're like the, the, the typical expression that we often, I understand where you're coming from. Mm. And I guess so like, certainly from my experience, you know, it's rare um, that anybody might turn around and go, yeah, really? Yeah, um, I mean, it is devil's advocate, but I think yeah, yeah, ab absolutely. But that. yeah, I think it's Im I think it's important that so like the, you know, while you're talking with the client, you know, if they start talking about something, mm. you know, you might turn around and say, uh, you know, and this comes back to your like Monique's point about you're like talking to them about who you are, mm -hmm. you know, not just what you do, but you know, like who you are, what your experiences are of, you know, just being honest and say, you know, you know I, you know, I personally haven't got any experience of that, so. I can't, you know, I can only imagine, yes. you, know, mm -hmm. you know, what it's been like for you. And at that point, without going into your know, therapy or counseling, you might say, look, you know, if it's important, would, you know, would you like to tell me a little bit more about that? Would you like to tell me what it's been like for you? Would you like to tell me, um, you know, like how it's been for you? And I accept that we're using, you know, like, a, you know, like a would you, you know, as a close question and recognizing that it is, um, yeah, the alternative for that would be you're like you know, I would invite you to you're like tell me a little bit more about that mm. if you think it's appropriate. So there's you know, there's a different ways of doing it, mm. but I think it's important that you're know, at that point you're working with the language you're like of the client. So you know, if they're used to you know things like you're like would you like to then you know that's what you know that's mm. what I would be using. I think the the other thing as well is that you you, know, you really have to tune into you know, what's going on for the client at the point that they say something. So if it's, you know, does it look like it's emotional? If it is emotional, what kind of emotion? You know, does it look like they're angry, upset, fearful, you know, happy about something? You know, you know what's going on for them at the point that they're, they're telling you? And, you know, if you're really, really astute, you might pick up on, right, are they telling me this you know, like, as just a fact? Are they telling me this from memory or are they, you know, like, are they now starting mm. to relive something? Because if it's the latter, you know, that is not a place that you want to be in you know, because we're not counsellors, we're not psychotherapists. And it's being able to pick up on that. And I have used language before such as, you know, I'd like you to tell me about this. I don't want you to relive it. I don't want you to be stepping back into the past. I just want you to tell me from your memory you know, what was going on, you know, what was it, you know, what was it like for you? Uh, and either side of that, I might ask some permission as well. Mm, thank you. I'll come back to you in a moment, Monique, if I may, but I would say um, that if, if coaches can learn the sort of language that says things like, I can only, and a tonality, pitch pace is also incredibly important, particularly when we're coaching, mentoring, virtually you know i can only imagine what this must have been like for you rather than this which i think is very glib yes i understand yes i understand uh because you're right david there are going to be very few clients who are going to go really how did you solve this problem then um uh, but you're opening yourself up for that situation particularly those cl uh, coaches who keep saying i understand and sometimes they say it quite a lot uh so i would hesitate to uh have any of the students that i've worked with pick up on that language using, I can only imagine, and again, the pitch, pace, and totality is a much better way of handling it. Monique, what's your take on this, please? I think what this amounts to is creating an environment of psychological safety mm -hmm. for the client, a place where, as David mentioned before, is non-judgmental, and for the coach to be able to really understand or try to um, see where the client is coming from, what languaging are they using, and that even in the coach's tone of voice, because we can 
be judgmental even in a tone of voice. Mm -hmm. If we're not careful, we can have a condescending tone. We can, so it's, it's really important to be sincere, ask those open-ended questions and let the client know that this is a safe place where they can open up to us, they can share. And, and I think that's really part of building trust is to build that environment of psychological safety. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, the whole point of us putting together this uh, series of capability-based CPD calls is to help practitioners especially get through the accreditation process as smoothly as possible. But it's also very much aimed at those experienced practitioners who have developed bad habits over the years. Uh, and you're absolutely right uh, that non-judgment can come through in a various ways. Uh, you know, I work with a lot of students and I might hear it in their tonality. I might see it in their facial expressions, a raise of an eyebrow, uh, or I might hear it in a little sound like, ooh, or wow. Uh, and it's kind of, it's an involuntary escape. Um, but again, the non-judgmental side is really important to building trust. So what would you add to, um, ha you know, the, the, the practitioners listening to this can think, oh, yeah, that's me. I've developed a bad habit or I didn't know that in terms of how do you create that non-judgmental environment? And we'll, we'll keep the order, I think, just for ease. So we're not talking over each other, David. Okay, so I think the the first thing to recognize is that we all have biases. Mm -hmm. And no matter how much we can say, you know, I am completely non-judgmental about mm -hmm. everything, the reality is that you are. Mm -hmm. Because there are certain things you know, in life that you have a specific view about. You know, and that might be uh, you know, things around animal cruelty, it might be things about you know, like dietary habits, it might be things about you know, like the environment, you know, anything like that. And it's important to recognize that somebody might suddenly talk about something which for you is a red flag. So that goes back to what we were saying earlier on about the emotional intelligence and the self-awareness is that sudden, all right, you're like somebody's raised what normally for me, and I emphasize the word normally for me would be a red flag however um, I'm aware that you know, as a professional coach you know, I recognize that this person has the right to have their own beliefs you know, like their own values their own judgments about things it's not for me to judge them because you know what I'm dealing with is my own so like my own internal stuff mm. so recognizing it and also recognizing how easy it is for you to talk about certain topics and a nice, you know, just as a quick sidebar, a nice little exercise around that is just thinking about, right, you're like, what are the things that you, know, you, you are quite judgmental about or you're biased towards? And just write them down. And then you're like on a scale of one to five, just identify, right, if I had a client and they were talking about this, how, we, you know, how comfortable would I find? Not so much of the ease, but you know, how comfortable am I talking about that with that individual? You know, what sort of things is it going to bring up for me? And that links then into... Uh, things that we might talk about uh, later on in, in some of the other sessions about transference and counter-transference and projection and you know, like in a whole host of other things that might come up for us. The second thing um, is that we all have um, conscious and unconscious biases as well. And we don't always notice those. You know, there are things that come up that um, trigger something in us and we, we don't notice it. We might do in reflection afterwards. So once we've sort of parked all of that in the, so like in the big self-awareness bucket, um, the, the easiest way to be non-judgmental is, it just sort of, in my opinion, is just to be relaxed. You know, be relaxed with your client. Don't anticipate anything. Don't you know, like expect anything and just deal with stuff in the moment, what we call in the model, the sort of facilitative space. Because if you sort of like overreact, uh, or even underreact at certain points, the client will pick up on that. And then all of a sudden, so like that trust that you've been building, that rapport you've been building, you know, suddenly stops. It doesn't diminish, it just stops. So you're not looking for so like any of this, <gasps> you're like this sudden intake of breath of what, really? Mm -hmm. um, you know, you're talking to them. So like you're like, you're as open and as relaxed as you can. 
the other thing within that as well is that just because they've done something one way uh, and you've done it another doesn't mean that you were right and they were wrong and it doesn't mean that they were right and you you were wrong you like but yeah in any which way you, you mix it that's just what they did and that's you know, just where they are so that ability to um suspend judgment and deal with all of that you like internal mechanism that self-awareness the movement into your know, internal self-management and you know and building that helps in that ability to come across as being you know, like non-judgmental there's one other thing i saw like i want to just like you're like just add on to that which is at the point that so like something is flagged up if you're really really experienced so like as well as everything that's going on that ability to reflect in the moment you know what we would generally call so like, like reflection in action you know, you'll notice you know, like that internal change of your body you know, like that sudden um, internal feeling of you know it might be a little bit of surprise it might be you know, like anger it might be you know, like a step back it might be you know, like you know, i'm not sure about this there is nothing wrong depending upon where you are within the relationship and depending upon what type of coaching agreement you have in then saying okay yeah if i may i just want to share with you so like how you know like what you've told me so i like guess coming across so that you know so that you know i'm being honest with you so that you're know, like any other questions or anything else that happens you're know, in this moment doesn't appear to be a little bit more um so like off track you know rather than you know rather than anything else and that again comes back to the coaching agreement because if you've said look you know sometimes stuff comes up that you know, I, you know i might have a different view about and with your permission i'll always let you know if you know if something's come up because if it has then i might be processing it in you know, like in a completely different way hmm. And of course, that's going to come up in the next uh, CPD call, which is self in coaching as well. Um, so it's really important um, that we understand what our internal triggers are. And that comes with maturity and experience. Um, it also means that you have to be honest and authentic to, to mm -hmm. say at the early stages, actually, this isn't a subject or a client I want to be working with. So it's not being desperate of taking every penny and every client. Um, Monique, um, what, what, what have you got to say on the subject, please? So really, we're talking about being objective, non-judgmental, and it's, it's almost a mental discipline, if you think about it. And being very present, as David mentioned, there's a technique, I guess you would call it a technique, and it's called different things by different people, but I like to call it a beginner's mind. Mm -hmm. And when my executives ask me, you know, how can I be more objective when I'm working and coaching my, my direct reports, beginner's mind is acting as if this is the first time you've ever heard of this topic, the first time you've ever heard of this situation, pretending like you have no prior knowledge and you're coming at this fresh, you're listening to the client you're learning actually from the client as the client is explaining some things to you so it's trying to more or less empty your mind as if you have no prior bias which is very hard because that unconscious bias as david said is with all of us but it's a really good exercise to at least try and practice it because this all is quite a mental discipline yeah and I think there are a couple of things uh, that we can help students and um, new practitioners to remember getting into that mindset if you have a couple of minutes meditation to empty your mind and be in the moment if you come to the call with a blank sheet of paper it's that visual that you're not prejudging rather than what I hear with a lot of uh, students is that they're almost tell me what the topic is in advance with this little bit of homework. Mm -hmm. Then they've planned out the whole conversation. They've written 50 great questions and they're just not listening because they're waiting to dive in with that question. Uh, and they've decided the whole agenda. So I think you're right, Monique, that if you can, uh, and, and you, David, as well, you know, just be open in the moment. I think the clear white piece of paper is a great uh, tool just for reinforcing that 
uh, before you start the session. I was interested in what you said, David, about underreacting is almost as important as overreacting. So share a little bit more about that, if you would, please. Yeah, so this is very much about if, uh, yeah, so if we just take a step back to the, to the overreacting bit, we would generally think that that might be client comes out with something you're like just you're like out of left field that you react to, and it's like you're like shock horror gasp type of thing. But equally, if you've been working with a client and you know they've been trying you know, really really hard, you know, like to do something, and they've made. Um, you know, even if it's just so like the smallest of effort to do something and they've gained the smallest step forward and they're really sort of you know, like um, boisterous and you're know, like and, and lively about this you know, like, you're like, you're like it, it may only be small you're know, like but you're know, like I've managed to do this and you sit there and go well oh, that's good mm -hmm. you know, and you've just <laughs> and they look at you and go well you know I was sort of expecting something a little a little <laughs> bit more than that yeah. And I'm not saying that, you know, you, 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 you know, so you get out the, you know, the, the Christmas, you know, like spirally things. I'm desperately trying to think of that thing that you blow, but um, whatever it is, you know, and, and say, you're like, this is all great. But, you know, you want to be, you know, in tune with your client. Um, I think it's, re it's referenced somewhere. It might be co-active coaching about, you know, so like the, the dance that you have with your client, like you, you're, you're moving together. So if you think about ballroom dancing, you're like, you're like whoever's leading, whoever's, you're like, whoever's the partner, and that might change throughout the, so like the, the coaching session and the coaching engagement you know, at certain points, mm -hmm. is that there's a synchronicity you know, like to what's going on so that you know, as somebody becomes more excited, then you know, by mirroring, so like, you're like, you'll be a little bit more, you're like, that, that sounds really, really great. You're like, How did you feel about that? You're like, what do you think about that? What are you going to do next? Mm -hmm. um, so that you know, just being in tune, you know, with your client, you know, like allows you just to you know, like to pick up on that, so that you you're so synchronized that you you, know, you can move along. And you're absolutely right. The you know, just going back to what you were saying about you know, like the, the big long list of questions, and you know, I'll hold my hands up, you know, metaphorically, um, and say that you know, I've been there. You're like I've been there. You're like I've got the books. Oh, you're like here's a list of powerful questions. I think we all have. Right. You're like I'll I'll just I'll just wait to pounce like a sniper. Yeah. You're like yeah, not interested in that. No, I can't use that. No, I'm not interested in what you're saying. Oh, there's the opportunity to ask that question. And then you ask it, and then you think, great, I've asked that question. I've got no idea now what you're saying because I haven't really thought about the question yeah. afterwards. Yeah. And. Uh, I often say to people that you, know, you can you can think about any question that you want, but in reality, and this is my opinion, in reality, the only question that you know for certain that you can ask a client is a variation of what is it you would like to talk about today? Or yeah. you know, you know, you know, what would be beneficial for you to discuss in the time that we've got? Mm -hmm. What do you want to get out of the session time? You know, something like that. Because after that, you know, you've got no idea whether they're going to carry on with what they were talking to you about last time, if there was a last time, uh, or that something from the coaching agreement might have cheated. You've got that inkling, but you know, like, a lot can happen. You're like in 24 hours. You know, just look at the world and see what you know, what can happen in 24 hours. Um, so it, it, it's just really important to have that. Right, you're like you know, almost. You're like when they come in, let the dance begin. And uh, one of the things that you used to say in uh, so like in martial arts, so like when you're know, certainly competition, was if you can you know, almost get your breathing to be at the same as your opponent, then you you know, you'll both be moving at the same you know the same rate and everything else, and you know, and that's trying to get that you know that synchronicity. Mm. I'm not saying for any moment that you like you should be hitting your clients. By the way, so mm. this is a quick point about I, that from the martial arts I, perspective. I think this um, uh, comment about underreacting, you've made me realize it's actually a much bigger issue uh, than I initially thought when I just raised it with you because it's taken me back to assessment calls and the amount of times um, when you hear a client come up with a little idea, obviously it's very tentative because people are people pleasers. They come up with a little idea if the coach doesn't then praise them for doing something proactive, 
if they just routinely and mundanely say, okay, and then what's my next brilliant question that I want to ask, you know, because like you say, David, they're plucking it out of the air or they've got this list. It kind of completely throws the client uh, and damages the rapport and the trust. They don't know whether that was a good thing to say or a bad thing to say. So their creativity is caught kind of shut down by that um, underreaction. So yeah, I think people have got to be very much aware of their own habits and just saying brilliant, fantastic, uh, you know, rah, 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 or okay, 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 is not cutting it. So when I'm talking to uh, student practitioners about uh, uh, rapport, praise is a really big part of this. <clears throat> And of course, praise has got to be genuine, it's got to be tailored, it's got to be meaningful and specific. Uh, otherwise, the client is just going to feel like it's production line. It doesn't mean anything. And of course, then you've got to take into account culture. So a lot of uh, northern, eastern, northern countries, you know, you've got to win the Nobel Peace Prize before they'll accept any praise. You know, they're just not brought up with praise. But I think if it's tailored and meaningful and genuine, a little bit of praise is going to open that creativity, helps to make the client feel safe and is massive for building rapport. What, what are your thoughts around this? under reacting type situation Monique I have a really good example of oh, something good. that happened to me uh, decades ago when I was being coached by a coach and you know we're all told that it's really important to pause and allow some silence in our conversations and in our coaching and even when we're presenting in front of a group, that pausing helps to kind of drive a point home. And it's very important. So th this coach actually took that a little too far to where I was considered underreacting. And he would allow too much silence mm. after I would say something or make a point. And it was to the point where I wondered if he was even still on the phone because he was not reacting at all or saying anything the pausing was too long, the silence was unbearable. Mm -hmm. And so I began to wonder, what, what is that all about? Mm -hmm. uh, it, it definitely was an underreaction. And I didn't know if I should continue on the topic or if that meant I should talk about something different. Was he uncomfortable with the mm -hmm. topic? Mm -hmm. So I think we also have to gauge that piece of it too, the, the silence that we put into our sessions and into our conversations. Mm. That's a brilliant point, uh, Monique. And as assessors for the IAPCNM, I've also come across some practitioners who follow a particular model where they literally leave this really long, regular science, uh, silence. Yeah. And of course, as we're increasingly uh, doing business virtually online, you know, Skype, whatever, you don't always have the video on you are kind of wondering, is that person still there? Um, so yeah, silence is, um, is a really valuable and useful tool, but it has got to be used in the right way. So say a few words, if you would, Monique, you, you raised it. So you keep talking about silence, the different types of silence. Then we'll hear your take on it, please, David. Monique. Oh, I thought you were talking <laughs> to David. No, you uh, raised it. So I'm, I'm changing the order. It's my okay. fault. I know I said David, but as you just raised it, I thought, well, it's fresh in your mind. You want to uh, build on that momentum. Yes, yes. So I think it's, it's very important to have some types of acknowledgement interjected mm -hmm. into the conversation and so that the silence isn't exaggerated. And, and you're right, virtual, without camera, you start to wonder what's happening on the other side. And then it adds a level of uncomfortableness mm. to the call. And in my case, I was uncomfortable with, how, okay, how should I proceed? Am I supposed to break the silence? Is he waiting for me to say something? So it was a, an uncomfortable moment. And this particular coach tended to have that habit. I haven't seen it too often. Uh, going forward, if anything, I see almost the opposite where 
coaches may say too much and not leave enough enough silence. But I, I also think there's an important piece here to, to segue a bit into something you said, Don, about praise and acknowledgement. That segues into empowerment. And I think it's very important as a way to build trust to empower the client in various ways because it's incredibly courageous for someone to start coaching, to be coached. They are making themselves very vulnerable. They're agreeing to be vulnerable. And when they're working with a coach, I think it's important for the coach within the whole coaching relationship to be sure to empower them in various ways. And if that's related to praise and acknowledgement throughout the coaching conversation, I think those little words of empowerment go a long way. Hmm. David, um, we obviously assess practitioners. We've got a team of people who do this and we come across students who have used all sorts of models. This silence issue, I've noticed, as Monique says, is very distracting for the client when we play the client on the other end of the phone. Um, but I also find it comes up quite a bit when they give us written exercises to do or visualizations to do. It can, it can backfire badly, can't it? Yeah, the, I, have, I have a simple sort of like view of things like that. So the in terms of the amount of science you're given, so like, you know, I, I totally agree with what Monique was saying about the, the empowerment and you know, like sometimes there's, there's just not enough. But the silence part is really picking up on, you know, what's going on for the client. And, you know, and it, it's, it's just so intuitively linked to listening that, you know, whether you're watching them or not, you know, when you've asked a question and they've started to answer, you know, you should know whether there's a you know, whether they've paused and they're thinking or you know, whether they haven't you know, like you you shouldn't you know once you get experience you won't need to the hesitant to use the word shouldn't there but you know, like you won't need to actually see them you're like you you'll just know and there's nothing wrong with so like you're like putting a you know, like an interject in there and saying you know, like just you know, ju just take your time just you know, like reflect if there's if there's anything more that you want to add to that or you know if it does sound like they disappeared. Just simply say, you know, like, yeah, is there anything more you want to add? Yeah, and it's it's a blatant closed question because it'll either be yes or it'll be no, or they'll add something you're know, like, or they won't. And then you can, you know, you can go on from there. But I think the sorry, the the other aspect of it in terms of you know, like giving people exercises to do and, and so sort of like in visualizations is that like all models, like all tools. You, know, you learn how to use them and you learn how to use them in the best way with the correct timing and everything else. Because um, I'm quite visual. So if somebody said, you're like, can you visualize or, you know, uh, X, Y, Z, then I can probably do that. Um, I'm reasonably reflective as well. So if somebody said, look, like, just take a couple of moments to, you like to mull that over. But that's picking up on two aspects. Well, actually, it's picking up on two different aspects. One of them is my learning style, which is predominantly visual, and one of them is part of my personality preference, which is reflectivity. And the more that we can listen to the way that our clients speak, the more we can start to use things such as, okay, you know, take a few moments, just reflect on this, and then and then come back to me with you know with your thoughts, your observations, you know, something like that. So it's still a question, but we sort of stick a you know, like an instruction on the end of it, or sorry, the beginning of it, so that we know that you know, that we're managing the time, and that means that you know like we're not just leaving them them dangling, because if if I was going to be you know, like really brutal, and I was saying right, you know, like let's say for example I'm paying somebody like 150 pounds an hour for a coaching session then I want to be coached for, a, you know, like for that whole 60 minutes. I don't want 20 minutes of it to be me thinking about stuff because I can do that afterwards. You know, I, you know, for me, I want, you know, like I want action. Mm -hmm. For some people, you know, we'll pick up on the fact that their, their natural personality style is that they need time to reflect. They need time to mull things over. Uh, but, you know, again, you know, they don't want that all the way through. It's, mm -hmm. you know, it's interaction. It's right. You know, 
just take a moment and this is where yeah, I could be really pedantic here so I can get the theosaurus in the dictionary and go right let's have a look at you like what is the definition of a moment and part of that is you're like if you know your client then you know from that very first session you'll start to pick up on right you know what what do they need and I think it like everything else, and, and, and this is sort of specific advice for you know, for people who've just come out of coaching their yeah, programs, that there's a reason why coaching models are called models, because it's you know, it's there are different stages to go through, and it's almost the step by step, so like you like blueprint for for learning how to do something, yeah, and, and we get that in so like in all walks of life, but. Um, the analogy that I that I would give is so like if, if you look at a model in a shop window, then you know the outfits on those models change depending upon you know, like what people want, what the seasons are, you know, like and you know, like and a whole host of other things. And it's important as a practitioner to recognise that you know, like that model can be adapted and it should be adapted to you know, like to different clients, because if you went something th- uh, like grow for example and you're exploring options. Then you know, you might say that you like just just take a couple of moments you know, and think about the you know, the various different options that you've got. But if somebody is very action orientated, they might not want to do that. Yeah, you know, they might purely want right. Okay, you're like yeah, you know, these are the actions that I that I can take, and they might just want to go for it. So it's important to recognise that silence works. It works well with some personality types. It doesn't work well with others. Uh, and as Monique was saying, and yeah, and I, I would, I would equally say this about me. If I'm being coached, I'll have a little bit of silence. Uh, but yeah, you know, once that once that starts to go on, uh, I'm old and wise enough now to say, look, uh, I appreciate what you're doing with the you know, so like with the reflective silence gaps, uh, but they're starting to you know they're starting to be a little bit too many, and that brings us back, you know, so like to the trust and the coaching agreement because. If I'm working with a coach for myself who you know, like understands that, they will just respond in a non-judgmental way. Thank you. Okay, I appreciate you telling me that. I'll make sure that, like, that, you know, like, that we don't continue down that way. And that'll be it. You know, and it'll move on. And I will have a greater trust that you know, like my feelings about the way that I want to work have been picked up by, you know, by the coach on the other end. And that's why... <clears throat> as coaches we need to prove that we're adaptable that we understand one size doesn't fit all and that as you say david will come out in the coaching agreement you might not get the whole picture but if you listen to the flags um and your intuition you'll get a sense of this is the person that i want to work with this is the the the, the uh, type of things that might work with them and as you say take on board that feedback um something when you were talking came back to me um i can't remember exactly what you were saying at the time but it was also it was about mirroring and using clean language we hear these terms quite a lot um, but obviously as experienced senior and master and fellow coaches we understand them but for the benefit of the practitioners who are listening um david if we start with you if you could both please just uh, give us your definition or some examples of mirroring and clean language what it means and why it works in terms of establishing a deeper trust and rapport okay well thank you for that uh, multiple question i'll try i'll try and remember all of those four points okay so uh in in terms of mirroring there's a uh, there's a general so like a general guidance around coaching is um I'm a coach. Uh, if I've got the correct coaching skills, then I can work with anybody in any, in any field. Mm-hmm. And what I would say to that is, yes, but you need to understand the language. You, know, you need to understand so like, you're like, what they're talking about. So, for example, if I was working with a finance director and they said, you know, I'm interested in developing my interpersonal skills, then you know we would have a conversation about you know well, what do you mean by interpersonal skills? What are you looking for, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I could work with them comfortably. If they turn around and say, I'm really looking at developing my ability to deal with global global finance and the use of a beater and everything else, I'm just gonna go, oh, whoa. Um, 
you know, I think what you know, possibly you either want a coach who specializes in working with finance directors or you're looking for a mentor or you're looking for a training course. Um, but, but I'm certainly like, certainly not the person. And the reason that I that I sort of come back to that is that when you're mirroring you're sort of within that uh, conversation, what you don't want to be doing is always going, oh, yeah, that sounds very interesting. What do you want about? Yeah, that sounds very interesting. I've got no idea what you're talking about. So the mirroring part is about you know, like listening to the language that they use and the tonality and the pace and you're like responding back so like in a you're like in an appropriate way without looking uh, patronizing so it's it's using their so if they for example turn around and said uh, you know i can really visualize where this is going you might lay you know, at one point say you mentioned earlier on that you could visualize where you were going you know, tell me a little bit more about that you know that you're like what does it look like um and then you you, you can have that that conversation the clean language part is very much about keeping it simple, keeping it straight to the point, and not trying to confuse them with you know, any sort of uh, any sort of language. Now, this will vary depending upon the client that you have and you know the area that they work in. So, you know, for example, um, if you were working with somebody who came out of the so like the, the educational establishment and they were a senior lecturer they may talk about you know, their issues, their topics, and being aware to just like, respond back with that clean language you know, is really important because you use your client's language, you're like not yours. So this is where the listening and the rapport and, and everything else you know, comes up. Because back at the coaching agreement, you, know, you might have had that conversation about, tell me a little bit about yourself. You're like, what do you do? Um, so you, you've got that general understanding. Mm. Um, and what were the other two bits? I told you I'd forget. I think it was just examples, uh, but you've, you've given examples in that. All right, brilliant. Thank you. Monique, uh, what, if anything, would you like to add? It's so important to be where the client is at the moment, which is the whole key to coaching. Sometimes if my clients complicate the conversation, with their own internal ter terminology or languaging. Sometimes a, a good open-ended question that I ask is, what's a better way to simplify this? What's a better way to simplify the topic, the, the conversation? Let's, let's try to keep it simple. What would that look like? And then it, it helps them reframe things a little bit and come at it in a different perspective because they're, there are so many types of terminology for different industries and clients, even their own in internal self-talk mm -hmm. uh, produces a lot of different types of terminology. So it's important for the coach to help them simplify that. And that can be done with, with open-ended questions and just keeping them, keeping them on track and focused and not having them overly complicate things. Mm. So to simplify that, I would say, uh, don't put words in the client's mouth. If they say they're worried about something, don't ask them what they're angry or confused about. Because they're going to go, well, I didn't say I was angry. Uh, mm -hmm. That sort of thing is what puts rapport and trust a step back. Um, so the other thing that I would add is a lot of new practitioners and students mistake mirroring for repeating something parrot fashion verbatim. Nobody wants to have half their session used with a practitioner who's repeating everything that they say. Uh, but there's a, a time and a place for it, but not verbatim. Mm. I'll just uh, I'll just quickly add something there as well, Don, because you've, you've just yeah. jogged, uh, jogged my memory about, you know, about the words that we use. Uh, and you were saying when somebody says, you know, worry, you know, and you say, you know, and you use anger. Mm. The other one to avoid is coming out with anything like, oh, that must have been very X, Y, Z for you, because mm. that's making a judgment. Yes. Uh, and you don't know that. So when somebody says, oh, well, you're like, we did this, and you go, oh, yeah, that must have been very rewarding. Mm. And they go, not really. Yeah. yeah and, and, and you've sort of opened up that, that rabbit hole that you now have to get yourself out of. Or, oh, yeah, that must have been quite distressing for you. No. Yeah. It, yeah, was, it, was just, it was just something that happened. So, um 
you know, always catch it. And it goes back to the judgment bit we were talking about. Always catch yourself before you say that must have been. Mm. Yeah, you, know, you can change it into a question, which you know, which is easier mm. and easier to deal with, which is simply, you know, how was that for you? Even just going, oh, <laughs> mm. oh, that. <laughs> just the oh is quite judgmental, or it can be. Mm. Now, I've never, I don't think I've ever heard myself say this. Say this uh, so I hope it's not now going to be in my head. Oh, that must have. <laughs> so I need to wipe that out of my head now and forget about it. So before I ask you for your top tips, <clears throat> um, I just want to go back to the self-disclose, which is almost how we started the conversation. Um, uh, and I'll give you an example uh, just to um, <clears throat> give you a moment while you think about your top tips. As an expat living in an expat community, I'm amazed at how people start a conversation and immediately start self-disclosing. And by the time you walk away, you know what they were in their previous life, what their house is worth, um, where their kids are going, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And it's very damaging to self-disclose unless asked. And I think even when a client asks us for a suggestion or our opinion, giving it at that stage is disempowering them. We need to almost be able to say, look, thank you for valuing my opinion, but right now this is your time. Um, I'm going to be asking you questions that is going to free you up for you to come up with your own. But if you are stuck genuinely, I can share what some of my other clients have done to succeed in this area. You're still not self-disclosing. Um, so what, what's your take on the whole self-disclosing thing? Mm -hmm. Because I know as we started out by saying people buy people. So you've got to do enough. So the person recognizes it. I like you or you're like me, but what's your take on it, David? Well, I'll go back to the, so like the, the emotional intelligence uh, part of it. And one of the aspects of emotional intelligence is uh, so like openness and honesty. And there's a sort of scale which says that, on one hand, you can be uh, overly open and honest. Mm. Um, on the other hand, you can be you know, like very closed off. And then somewhere in the middle is the um, realistically sort of like open and honest. And that's really where you want to be from a from an emotional intelligence point of view. It's you know, recognizing sort of like where the boundaries are of how much self disclosure you need to do. Yeah, uh, if any, and you know, if you if you are going to disclose, then normally that would come with a you know a permission request, which is you know, I have some I have some personal experience of that, or I've had a number of clients who've had similar experiences. How useful would it be for me to you know tell tell you a little bit about that? And the important thing about that is. You know whether it's self-disclosure or whether it's you know, like talking a little bit about your know, like other clients. If it's self-disclosure, uh, recognize that you know, you are opening yourself up by you know, talking about things that didn't work as well as the you know, things that did. And if you're talking about clients, uh, make sure that you cover sort of you know, like all aspects of confidentiality with it. So you're not saying you know here's a client I had and then you know, like listing everything about them, but crucially what links all of that together is you're not telling them what to do so you need to phrase it in such a way of you know recognizing that look this is what was going on for me at that time this is what was going on for a client at that time this is how they dealt with it which was what worked for them in those circumstances in that moment at that time with the resources they had yeah and then without going back to somebody and um so simply saying, so what could you learn from that? Is very much about just going back and saying, you know, you know, based on that, okay, you're like, what could you do? You're like, what are you able to do? Because you're not saying this is what they did. That's what you should do. And you know, again, you know, going back to the the biases and you know the judgments that we have in our head, it's not unusual for you know, like the experienced coaches when somebody comes out with the right, yeah, this is what's going on for me, at the back of your head is just that instant, well, why don't you just do that? You know, which instantly solves the problem in your mind. But until you explore, you know, 
what resources they've got, what's going on for them, you're like, and everything else, you, know, you don't know whether that would work. So it's always about offerings rather than, you know, like instructions. And yeah, never be frightened. And uh, I learned this with um, when I worked with Samaritans for quite a bit, that certainly when you're dealing with emotions, people are more likely to turn around and say, what would you do? What do you think I should do? Because they're in that, you just sort of like that emotional state. And a, a simple response to that is just, it's not about me, it's about you. You know, and this is where the empathy comes by. It's not about me, it's about you, and it's about what would work best for you. Okay. And yeah, you know, and and that's it really. Thank you. Monique. I start doing some self-disclosure even in my marketing and on my website. So by the time clients get to me, they already know a little bit about me. So I have had situations in sessions where clients will say, well, this is what you did or this is what happened to you. So I like to put it back on the client and say, well, yes, but in your circumstances, which are unique, how you know what would be a better way for you to do it or something like that that turns it back to them and brings them back to the fact that okay yep yep she's different I'm different circumstances are different there's many different options on how something can be handled what would work best for me so I try to put it back to them in the way in the form of open-ended questions okay thank you so just to wrap up then top tips if there are any that spring to mind that perhaps uh, cover topics that we haven't addressed around building that rapport that establishes the trust. David? Uh, oh, all I would say is that, because I think we've, we've covered in the main, we have. Um, the, the, the key elements. What I would say is that from, from an assessment point of view, um, we're looking for, so like the coaches to recognize that you're know, like the client, yeah, picking up on one of Monique's words, uh, the client is unique and the situation that they're in is unique to them and therefore the way that they deal with it is unique to them. So that it, it's not a like a one size fits all. Um, that it's very much about sort of you're like asking permission if you're going to be dealing with something that's a little bit more more sensitive. Um, and that uh, I think sort of like one of the things that we haven't quite touched on but it's it sort of come up you know, like almost anecdotally is that coaches are curious yeah, you know, about what's going on for the client. So that they come across as being genuinely interested in the client and what the issue is, and genuinely interested in helping them you know, resolve whatever that that issue is. So they're the things that, that we would look for. And so, like on the so like the opposite side of that, the, the contraindications is you know, simply not doing that, and the. So like the the final point I would put about trust is that is always remembering the thing I mentioned at the beginning, which is uh, trust takes a little bit of time to build up, um, but it's really easy to lose. You know, like in you know, like in one simple comment, uh, yeah. or even you know, like no comment. You know, like if we're going to you know, go back to the you know, like the the underwhelmed bit, yeah. um, and the more that so like the more that you build it. The, the more you will get used to so you like to, to building that with you know with your other clients and also when you get testimonials in it looks really nice you know if a client turns around and says you know for example you're like yeah it was great working with monique not only is she a great coach um she built rapport you know like I, I trusted her with everything that i was coming out with you know that looks great in the testimonial mm -hmm. and she is absolutely <laughs> Just very quickly, because I'm conscious of the time, uh, we usually uh, run these calls for about an hour. Anybody who's got any questions, put them in the chat box now. Um, if you think about your questions after our hour, literally it's going to be up in a minute or so, um, and it's not a burning question for us to deal with right now, we will deal with it afterwards by email. So Monique, um, what if any uh, tips do you have that you would like to add, please? One main tip, since it's so important around the non-judgmental piece, objectivity, I really feel that coaches should practice presence, but outside of the coaching sessions, learn about it, practice it outside of your sessions with your clients, understand how to get yourself present, 
because it does take practice. It can't just happen during a coaching session. So if a coach can come to a session already understanding how to be present, that will build trust that much quicker. Mm, lovely. I love that one. I've got two uh, of my own to add. Uh, and one is use your client's name. Uh, not just once, but two or three times in a 30 minute session. It's really important that they recognize that they're not a production line client, that you are actually listening to them as a person and you know them. Uh, the second point I would make is that we need to remember, um, and this will come out at various stages of all the calls that we're going to be making um, in this series, is that not everybody is or wanting to be a 10 out of a 10. So we have to recognize as coaches that if our client on a benchmark of one to 10, 10 being perfect, is happy moving from a two to a five, that we don't push them uh, to be more than they want to be. Not everybody wants to be a webmaster or an athlete or a top notch speaker. They are happy just to improve from where they are now and achieve their goals. So not to put pressure on them to be better uh, than they want to be, just because a lot of coaches are perpetual students and are always aiming for tens, recognize that our clients are not in that position. I think that's it, unless uh, either of you esteemed speakers and highly sought after coaches want to add anything else to today's really quite riveting subject on um, establishing trust no nothing for, nothing for me it's been a it's been a pleasure to be with both of you nothing for me also thank you so much for having me you're very welcome as always monique thank you very much thank you david and uh, this call for anybody who missed it will obviously be uh, replayed or if you want to hear it again because i know there were lots of nuggets in this uh, of wisdom you can listen to it as many times as you like so in our next call uh, david it's self in coaching just give us a little taste of what we can expect in that please okay so um self in coaching is you know going it, it, and it's a, an excellent link from so like what monique has just said is you know that's about you're like how do you, how are you present in the moment and you're like, how do you really engage with your client? So, you know, how do you use, you know, like thoughts, feelings, and reactions to, you know, like, to really explore what's going on for your client? Great. Thank you. Well, that's the 24th of April, 3 p.m. UK time. And uh, we look forward to seeing even more of you on that call then. Thank you, David. Thank you, Dawn.